Aloha. Aloha. Welcome to today's show, the state of the state of Hawaii on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. And uh, today's show continues our discussion uh, from our last show. It was a discussion of COVID-19's impact on the status of Hawaii's small businesses providing professional services, specifically the practice of law. In our last time conversation, we discussed how the setbacks for small businesses are currently unavoidable as the virus continues to, um, um, to be even um, more difficult and in even our less con uh, COVID uh, affected state, one of the least uh, deaths in the nation. So um, legal practices are declining and even going away as clientele postpone and cancel and no longer use professional legal services. This situation prompts questions <laughs> about how the state government has and has not intervened to protect small businesses that underpin the state's welfare and health. We will cover some of the questions from the perspective of a recent case uh, with our guest today, who are two experienced Hawaii lawyers. And the first one is Scott Makuakani, who has, whose business focuses on estate planning and administration. And uh, James Hochberg, whose focus includes contract related issues and constitutional litigation. Welcome, Scott. And oh. welcome, welcome, Jim. Glad you're back. Thanks. Well, on the last show, uh, we talked about Hawaii's dire economic situation and, uh, and uh, it, its decline and its potential future decline unless something really changes soon. And uh, we've talked about what the state can do to lessen the damage uh, for um, the economy. And, and other areas too. But uh, this, this questions how the governor's use of his emergency powers can help. That was one of our topics last time. So um, you both and, and Jim especially explained an action in early May of the government to impose an order 127A on the state, which required a 14 day uh, quarantine for all visitors. Uh, that has since been extended until the end of um, July. But Jim brought a case challenging the unconstitutionality of this order, and maybe more. Well, would you briefly summarize your issues that you shared uh, last time against the, the sure. order? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd be glad to, actually. Um, so Hawaii is exactly the same as every other state except we're 3,000 miles away in the middle of the water but we are part of the united states we are governed by the same constitution even with all that water in between and because the constitution of the united states guarantees the right to interstate travel just the way people can drive from california through every state all the way to florida or new york and they can't be stopped and they can't be required to pay a entry fee or have an immigration stop or, you know, you can't do that stuff. It applies here too. People have the constitutional right to travel to Hawaii. Now, our case was bringing up the point that because the people have the right to come here, the government can only interfere with that through like this quarantine if they meet the constitutional standards. The constitutional standards require that the government use the least restrictive means to accomplish their legal goal. And our case is saying, judge, quarantining every single person that gets off an airplane without regard to whether they are contagious or not, or infected or anything else, is too broad. It's, it's too sweeping and broad, and it's not targeted to solving the problem. It's just making it easy on the government to do their job. If they're not doing their job right, they're doing it as easy as they can. And so uh, 
Harmeet Dillon from the American Center for Liberty and I co-counsel, she's in San Francisco, I'm local counsel here. We filed that case in federal court a couple of weeks ago and we followed it up with a motion for a temporary restraining order, which means we asked the judge before the case gets started to order that the state of Hawaii, the governor essentially, stop quarantining people that don't have any reason to be quarantined except they're getting off an airplane in front of and behind the person in line. And what the judge said was she didn't want to issue that relief, which is actually, it's hard to get. You don't always get uh, restraining orders at the beginning of the case. And uh, she said she didn't want to do it. And so she did not. Uh, and it's important for people to realize she did not rule on the merits of the case. She ruled on whether we could have that emergency relief at the beginning or whether we have to go through the process to prove our uh, right to have that kind of injunctive relief. So the press coverage that says she upheld quarantine. She actually wasn't even asked at this stage to do that. And yet um, the newspapers, I mean, the, the publicity on it did use the, the word upheld. It did, it, it did. It's like yeah. that, upheld. How did they make that mistake? And so here's the interesting thing. If, if, if you want, I can share what she started and ended her 25 page order our motion. And, and basically she's focusing in on Chief Justice uh, John Roberts at the US Supreme Court uh, a couple of weeks ago in a case about COVID dealing with churches not being allowed to meet in California. It went to the Supreme Court on an emergency order not after the case was done. And he basically said, the Constitution principally entrusts the safety and the health of the people to politically accountable officials in the states to guard and protect. The latitude of officials must be especially broad when acting in areas fraught with medical and scientific uncertainties. If officials do not exceed these broad limits, they should not be subject to second guessing by an unelected federal judiciary, which doesn't have the expertise of medical stuff. So basically what the judge was saying is, she's not gonna get involved in that question at the beginning of the case. She's gonna want us to present the medical evidence and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and she still may decide that it's better to leave it up to the elected officials. But the very cool thing is after we filed our lawsuit, both the governor and the legislature activated themselves to do what we said they should be doing, which is this testing regime and not quarantining everybody. So they kind of proved that we were right. What they were doing and still are doing isn't right. And now they're working on maybe, depending on how it comes out in the final version, a more constitutional process. Well, are you referring to the requirement to have a, an, a test result? prior to arrival in Hawaii? Uh, that, well, that's that not a requirement. And that's the other thing the press misses. When the governor does a press conference on June 24th and he says stuff, but he doesn't follow it up with an official order, it's just him giving a press conference. So as of right now, there is no order to test anybody. As we talked about last time, the governor's power to order stuff ended on May 3rd, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And I think that's why the legislature last Monday came, or two Mondays ago, came back into a session to work on this bill to give the health department the power to test people coming. Because they realize the governor's out of time. Okay, so uh, yeah, so it, it is shifting back into the shape it should have taken in the beginning, perhaps with the legislator, legislature back, and at least they gave the work to the health department. It looks like it. I was going to ask a question about, isn't the legislature duty bound to follow up on these things? As you said, they ran away at the first sign of somebody's <laughs> yeah. and had three weeks of vacation or whatever. And so um, is there any consequence to that? Does that, I mean, it raises the expectation that they will perform 
their duty. Well, right? the, the process that the legislature goes through is an amendment of proposed laws. And so I like to wait until they're actually done to see what it turns out to say, because what it says when it's a law is what the law is. And in our case, we are watching. And if the governor or the legislature creates a legal obligation on this testing regime, and it's it's too irrational or it's too broad or whatever whatever it turns out to be in the final version, uh, we could amend our complaint and add this new thing that still isn't right to our case. The case is actually very young. Uh, okay, so I had the question that uh, I wanted to ask you about the fact that Hawaii and Alaska are the two non-contiguous states, right? Because uh, uh, Puerto Rico's not really a, the same, is it? But anyway, Alaska and Hawaii are in position to actually uh, get themselves uh, protected from uh, people coming in. So is it, and so with the fifth and the, and the um, 14th amendments requiring interstate travel or um, ensuring or saying we have to be able to have or we can't restrict interstate travel does it mean that um, Hawaii and or Alaska would always be unlawful in if they close their borders that that really isn't an well, option no it's no it's not an absolute like that if there was a condition in, in the society or in a group of people or something that rendered an emergency such that it was necessary and the, the only way the government could accomplish the protecting of the population would be to keep certain people out. They would be able to do that. That's what they're supposed to do. But just waiting at the exit point of the airplane in the terminal with the National Guard uh, for each person to come out in single file and capture them into quarantine. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's what they're doing. <laughs> well, I understood that it might be, and this would be a question of, um, well, in other words, I went back on the Alaska and Hawaii thing. So if Alaska and or Hawaii decided to do that, there would still possibly be litigation about it. I mean, if some Canadian or somebody in Washington state didn't like that because they go up to Alaska, they, they could file a suit, right? I mean, so like you, you said, it can be done, but that there, there would possibly be uh, suits against them for doing it, right? Well, would yeah, the constitution has requirements that protect our rights. And if those rights are violated unlawfully, unconstitutionally, somebody should sue yeah, to that's... protect them. That's what you're doing. That response, that oversight Correct. responsibility, is uh, is certainly uh, appropriate coming from legal section. But even uh, citizen wise, there should be oversight too. So, um, okay, that is um, about that contiguous issue. But the other uh, one you brought up is how broad will be whatever they decide may be the screens for people coming in and out. And what I've read they're thinking about doing is this testing that has to be done actually at where you come from. So you come up with your test results. And I guess that's where your single file metaphor works uh, or example works because then you can't get off the plane if you don't have your evidence of a positive, of a negative. Uh, now, would that be considered too broad? Is that the kind of thing that would be uh, what did you say at one time? Irrationally <laughs> discriminatory. Well, I, I don't. I don't think that that by itself is actually a bad idea, because then you identify people that, at least as of the time they took the test, were contagious, because there's different tests and different test results. So if the test says they currently have the virus, not that they had it before and now they have the antibody, which is different. If they are currently infectious, those are the people that probably need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. But then how you deal with them is another thing. Are you going to put an ankle bracelet on them so you know if they leave the quarantine place? I don't think that's permitted. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how crazy the legislation or the governor's order is going to be when it's finalized. Mm -hmm. Somewhere I read that that's one of the things. 
possible. But anyway, I'm sure they're brainstorming how to manage anything. So like do you know why all the other states don't have the same kind of a, a quarantine regime? Well, I heard that they are trying. So no, the, but, the, but the reason, the reason that they don't yeah, is because it's too hard to block all the roads. It's just impractical. But certainly they could do the same thing with the airplanes. In fact, that's what the Florida people say. Well, we can't eat because you're just going to look at our ticket and it says we're up from Miami, so you're not going to let us in. Um, but uh, our license plates, but there are other ways to get there. And you can't stop people at the border because of their license plates either. You have to actually have a specific reason that is geared to accomplish the compelling state interests, which in this case is not spreading the disease, and that the least restrictive, the, le the least intrusive way to accomplish that compelling state interest is what you're trying to do. If you could test people and not quarantine people that don't have the virus, that's a lot less restrictive on the travelers than only quarantining the infectious ones, which is the point that we're making, which after we filed our suit, now the governor and the legislature are working on, it, which they could have done starting on March 4th. They could have been working on that. Yeah, that was, that was your, your point. That was an important point that they, they should have been there and done, done the job and that it would be done by now and we'd be organized and there wouldn't be all this confusion, which is where we are now with all of these people coming into the state yesterday or very recently with um, 118 here for vacation. So what I, my co-counsel actually came here from California to do the hearing last week. And mm -hmm. she told me when she got off the plane, she was met by 10 or 11 army men. I'm sure they were reservists, but they were wearing army fatigues yeah. and they had thermometer things for your head and you couldn't get past them without uh, successfully completing whatever their testing was. And then they had paperwork for you on the quarantine and they asked for your phone number and they called your phone right there to make sure you didn't give them a fake number. Uh, it's very intrusive to everybody, regardless of whether they have any risky elements to their person or not. Uh, I'm very glad to hear that because what I read was that we just, as we fill out those forms coming back to Hawaii, that that was being used to determine the sections of people and what they were going to be doing. And now they're telling me we're spending, the state's spending a lot of money on, on making sure they are have temperature information and then what do they do if somebody has the virus would they take them to some special place um i mean that's very interesting because that's what china and and korea and these other nations have done is that they have used that data to identify potentially infectious people and then they've immediately removed them into some containment area or holding pattern. They didn't go home, they didn't go to the hotel. And then that's one of the ways we have of stopping the spread. But you know why they can do that? Oh, Their yeah. citizens don't have any constitutional rights. That's right. Oh I God. didn't move to North Korea. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they would uh, fight back probably. I mean, we would want, all of us would want to assert our civil rights and, and call a lawyer, right, because of that intrusion, uh, if we were contained like that. That's a really good point, because I have, I, I, you know, that's one, and that's one of the advantages of these dictatorial countries, where they can, they can manage uh, things a little bit uh, more. And I would say that's one of the things that makes our country really exceptional. It does. And the fact that states want to close themselves off only speaks to the importance of our federal system, which is about unification. So in, in, instead of us doing the kinds of things they do in these other countries with stricter government styles, we want to go up, we want to go high and get everybody uh, we're all in the same boat and we all have to work on this together. So it seems like the democratic way is to be able to, to, to lead the country into understanding what their duty is one to another and as citizens. Um, yeah, that, uh, okay. 
Well, I, I'm glad that I didn't realize that much was going on. I wonder why that's not publicized so much, or maybe I'm just missing it, but I, I, I really like knowing that because um, a lot of people said that they were three, there were 399 people on this recent arrival of um, a total of 754. I think this was seven two, which was um, last week. Anyway, so 118 of them I mean, 399 of them were visiting friends and family. I mean, so presumably they called those people at all those places where, so they had to put the number on the form probably. And that's how they managed to call them, presumably, because your colleague was called. At well, you, do you know that when you come in at the airport right now, you cannot take a taxi, you cannot do an Uber or a Lyft or a ride share. You cannot ride the bus. The only way you can leave the airport is if somebody picks you up. Well, that's also news <laughs> for me. I guess I'm not paying attention. Well, that, I mean, it's very, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that we've got that much strictness in, in the screening of people coming in. Otherwise, I mean, I've really worried about it since we are increasing now in the numbers of cases. So it, it, it occurred to me that we might, may not have done these kinds of things. But then the other question is, who's going to pay for all of this surveillance and screening? I mean, this is going to be enormously expensive when we go back to receiving, certainly like in July of 219, we were having 35,000 people coming in daily into Hawaii. Who's going to take care of that burden once they lift anything? So, I mean, certainly that would be great for the economy to get all of them in right now, come back. But then we'd uh, just have an up, uh, we'd have a, a set here in Hawaii for the movies to come and use with all these empty buildings everywhere because no people would be left, presumably. Stephanie, Stephanie I'm going to say something that some people are going to go crazy about. Okay. Japanese Americans were quarantined during the Second World War without respect to any individual risk. We are not allowed to do that in this country. Uh-huh, clearly. Well, okay, um, that's good to recall that the history um, and um, we need to respect that sacrifice that they made and mistake that the country made. But what are your next steps then on this case? So you're sitting there at this point and feeling accomplished in, in, in the stage of this case you're in and what happened. So what are the next steps to- So um, we have a couple of choices and we haven't actually decided yet. One thing that we can do is appeal this order denying our requests. That's a possibility. I don't know that we're gonna do that. We can, move forward with the case and watch and see what the governor and the legislature come up with. And like I said earlier, fold that new thing if necessary and appropriate into our existing case. Um, and it's interesting because in, in opposition to our motion, the governor had four or five medical doctors from the Department of Health working on the COVID stuff, submit sworn testimony under oath in the form of a declaration. And what's troubling to me about it is the information that they presented was medical information that was thought to be true in February of 2020, not the new information about infectiousness, mortality, morbidity, uh, all that, you know, treatments, uh, all, none of that stuff. All of what they were saying was the original bad data from February. And, and that's why I think the judge said, I don't wanna be the medical divider of truth at this stage. So, you know, we're gonna have epidemiologists that tell modern analysis of, of what's known and, and, you know, it'll go on from there. Okay, well, I wanted to go to um, a question about, to both of you about, um, well, well, first of all, I think, Jim, is it the case that this may resolve itself too if the legislature does its duty and they work on this and they have uh, an acceptable remedy, right, for how to could handle be. Could be. Right? 
so you could be satisfied and not and the need for more uh litigation could pass is that Stephanie, is there's that, always a need for more litigation <laughs> don't, don't butcher don't don't butcher say don't become a vegetarian <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so then if you, um, okay, so I understand there'll be something because it's important. Because Actually, there, there, let me explain it this way, and I won't be kidding, and I got to let Scott talk because he's really a smart friend of mine, but so there are certain claims that you can bring in federal court, and there are different claims you cannot bring in federal court, but you can bring in state court. So that issue about whether or not the governor's power ran out on May 3rd, it's in our case because it's a fact. That's the statute that gives rise to the violations. Mm -hmm. But our claims in federal court, constitutional rights to travel, not overstepping a state law. So a state court case is probably gonna be brought against the governor's excess unlawful power usage after May 3rd. But that would be a different case, maybe even different lawyers, different clients, uh, maybe me, I don't know. But I mean, those that's not been tackled in our federal court case. And there are reasons to file federal and state cases that to, you know, the, the choice that you take. Well, without your work, where's, the scrutiny to come from actually to to these issues like like Scott are you maybe you can talk to that even though you you're not in the same area of litigation or work in the same area as Jim does but is it does it devolve on on the legal profession to kind of provide this I mean it is a citizen's right too and as you've discussed trying to get clients who have these issues in mind and care about them and want to do something about it, but they don't want to become the nail in the coffin of the one that yeah, for bringing this against the state, much less however much you know that you have to to pay for that. But but um, so but where does the scrutiny fall? It's supposed to be on the citizens, or is it the legal on the citizens and then the legal profession to respond to that? But yeah, what, the Constitution isn't really self-effectuating. We've got to stand up for our rights. And thank God there are people like Jim out there who will take the cases and actually go in front of the courts. Um, but the, the, the Constitution really does have to be upheld by the people. It's got to be upheld by the people it protects. And so, yes, it is incumbent on the citizenry to, to stand up and take positions when our constitutional rights are being taken away. Well, that, that reminds us of the duty of citizenship, but I wanted to know if you all thought we have enough legal tools um, to deal with um, extreme um, crises such as COVID-19. Um, in fact, I mean, at the federal level, supposedly previous administrations had prepared orders for emergency situations like this that haven't been drawn on for the, the current situation. Does the state of Hawaii do the same thing? Is that a part of the repertoire or the agenda of the legislature? Are they remiss, negligent, irresponsible, and not having something in place? They're the lawmakers, so would that be a duty they've neglected? I mean, the governor's gonna have to take the heat on this, I'm sure, but what about them? I don't know if they've neglected it. This is a pretty unique circumstance. So who knew you know, that we were gonna have to deal with these issues? Um, I, I, I guess it can be argued that if the government were doing its job, it would think about these kinds of things because it's not that far fetched that right. there would be, you know, some infection going around the world that we'd want to avoid. Um, but I, I, I don't know that at this point we can accuse anyone of not having come up with a plan ahead of time. It's just how they've handled it since the issue came up. So we can't even use the ignorance of the law is no excuse because there's no law to be ignorant of at this point. But I, of those sorts of things, should the, the new mayor and uh, as we go to a new governor, I mean, what kinds of expectations should we have for them to meet these challenges? Yeah, well, this is one of the kind of circumstances. Go ahead. Well, the thing is in 2014, the Hawaii legislature did pass a brand new law 
which is the law that the governor is using for this emergency power thing. So there actually was a law and it was used and it was used properly on March 3rd, but that statute limits the governor's power for to 59 days on the 60th day, according to the statute language that was written in 2014. It's not like some ancient thing. Uh, it automatically terminated on the 60th day. So what that means in the law is on the 59th day, May 2nd, one nano stroke past midnight on the 3rd of May, it ended all by itself. Nobody had to do anything. The legislature gave the governor their legislative power for that 59 days. I have a, a representative and I have a senator. Why weren't they back at the legislature on May 3rd taking back their legislative authority and representing me? Now that's a good question. And on that, we have to have our aloha time. So we're gonna end our program on Think Tech Hawaii. And I'm gonna appreciate that you all were here to have this stimulating discussion. And I remind everybody that this is the state of the state of Hawaii. And uh, we'll see you next time. Aloha. and.